many of you, um, just a show of hands, how many of you have heard of um, non-invasive um, brain stimulation or transcranial? All oh, right, I can really get home. <laughs> I mean, like, there's nothing for me to say. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I'm not Mike Oxley. Uh, Mike asked me to step in um, on this um, very, uh, very last minute. So I've knocked together some slides for you, and I don't think I have my little presser that wasn't given this. Can I have one of those? Um, so I've knocked together some slides for you to, to just give you a bit of background on the products we do. And um, are they... Uh, 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 so I'll, I'll give you a bit of background on what we do and the kind of products we make. Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> um, so hopefully I'll be able to give you some background. So um, um, we, um, we are what I would call a neurotech company. Our, our foundations are in non-invasive uh, brain stimulation, but we see ourselves actually broader than that. Uh, we think it's a really um, exciting time to be in neurotech. Uh, thanks very much. On the, on the one hand, um, we've, we've got loads of um, really interesting um, uh, research coming out of, um, uh, out of neuroscience that's really letting us um, much better understand the functioning of the brain and influence the functioning of the brain as well. And then on the other side, we've got advances in, um, in manufacturing, in networking, in AI that, that's really making it far more possible to take that science and translate it into real-world products that can have real impacts, genuine impacts on people's lives. And at Focus, we see ourselves very much as facilitators in that translation process. So I guess, um, uh, like Jeffrey said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about neuroscience, quite a bit about neuroscience today, but I'm not actually a neuroscientist myself. Uh, my PhD is in machine learning and natural language processing. Um, and actually, none of us are neuroscientists at Focus. We're a team of um, engineers, um, a very small team, uh, there's four of us in the core team, uh, five or six, depending on how you count. So I'll be giving you very much um, an outsider's perspective on neuroscience. Um, that said, my partner is a neuroscientist. We met when we were doing our um, PhDs, Helga Gilmeister. Uh, we were doing a PhD sort of 10 years ago in London. And she's the first person that really turned me on to, to neuroscience. And we've been talking about doing something in neurotech space, even back then. But it just wasn't possible to do, because um, to, to do something, you'd have to design your own chip. It would take five years. It would, it would be really hard to do. And in 10 years, all of that, um, uh, that supply chain has really come into line. It's really making it possible to bring a lot of these things to market really quickly. So the world has just changed. Um, so, so the story of Focus really begins um, sort of about 12, uh, in about 2012. How do I do this? So it, um, it starts about 2012 when Mike and I were actually working on a completely unrelated project. Um, and Mike came across a, um, a, an article by a new scientist journalist called Sally D. And having talked to a few of you, you know, in the last couple of days, it sounds like many of you read this too. And were kind of really turned on by it as well. So what Sally did was she visited the, um, the lab of uh, Michael Weissen, who was doing some DARPA research into um, accelerated learning for, for snipers, for army snipers. And, um, and you know, Michael Weissman was claiming that he was doubling the, the learning rates of these snipers. And, um, and we read this, and we thought, like, wow. You know, like some of the stuff that Sally was talking about was this sort of this, you know, this zen-like focus, you know, utter sort of uh, concentration on her task at hand. And what she did was she went into um, his lab, and she was given this... Um, um, this test that they give, so she had to shoot these oncoming targets, and you know she tries it first of all, and she has a gun. She's just she's just awful at it. Then they put the electrodes on, and um, she sort of claims that after that she could just hit every single target. And so we're reading this, and we're thinking, wow, I mean this is this sounds pretty cool, right? We want to we want to try this. I mean, I mean, come on, we're at Transtech. I mean, if this stuff is true, then it could take your meditation to a whole new level, right? So so we're thinking, wow, this is really it's really amazing. Um, and um, so we did, you know, what seemed obvious. We went to the neuroscientist we knew best. We went to Helga Gilmeister, my partner, and said, well, like, you know, is this for real? I mean, are you really, guys really doing this? And she gave um, a pretty typical scientist response, and she said, well, yeah, it's a very interesting new kind of area of research, and you know, it's showing a lot of promise and you know, increasing popularity. We're, we're very optimistic. And then when she heard we wanted to try it, she was like, oh, no, hang on. Whoa, <laughs> boys, you really don't want to be doing this outside the lab. Um, but we weren't going to let that stop us. So we had a look around to see what we could actually 
um, used to t- try this out. And you know what? There, there really wasn't a lot. Um, you could go for something uh, like the image on the right, which is um, uh, a product produced by a company called Neurocon. Um, it's a German company. It's very popular among academics um, in, in Europe. Um, but the quotes for that were coming in at something like $5,000. Right? So if you weren't rich enough to afford that, you had to be crazy enough to try the thing on the left. Um, it's not actually the device that we found online, uh, but it looked pretty much like that. It's just basically a battery in a box with a switch. Um, it's a really bad idea to have square electrodes because the, the current pools on the edges and you get way too much density. I mean, this thing was potentially dangerous. So we weren't quite crazy enough to do that. We were crazy, but maybe not that crazy. So we started to think, well, what can we do? And, and we started to think, well, maybe we can make our own. And so we started to read a bit about the science. Um, and so that's probably a good, good time to take so just a pause. I mean, it sounds like a lot of you have heard of this, so maybe you already know this. So the basic idea behind TDCS, it's the sim- simplest form of non- non-invasive brain stimulation that neuroscientists use. And the you know, basic idea is you have two electrodes, you, know, you place them on your head, you have a positive anode, a negative cathode, and the ca- uh, one of the electrodes may come off, go on the shoulder or something like that. And, uh, and the idea is um, that the current passes through, and that can change the way that the brain operates. So if we just pause for a moment and look at um, like what's happening inside the brain. So, so uh, it, in, in space form, a neuron is, um, in its resting state will have um, positively charged ions along its outer membrane, negatively charged ions along the inside. And as it receives impulse from other connected neurons, the positive charge in the outside increases up to a threshold, and the threshold triggers the opening of iron gates. Sodium ions rush in. There's a rapid change in voltage. This cascades through the axon, and that's what sends a signal to another neuron, and that propagates through the brain. And this is going on all the whole time. And when, it's, when it's fired, it begins to reset and goes back to its state, uh, a resting state, and then receives new input. Right? So that's the process that's going on. And this is happening really quite rapidly. Um, uh, neurons are firing. This is how your brain communicates. Um, uh, sometimes um, it fires quite slowly, um, less than once a second, sometimes quite rapidly, above 100 times a second. Um, and what, what um, TDCS does, I mean, so we introduce some current. Um, actually, you know, the current is quite small compared to what's already in your brain, because obviously your brain is a, an electrical organ. Um, and it, it's not enough current to actually um, cause an action potential, but it's enough to raise the excitation levels of that neuron. So what we're doing um, is under the anode, where we introduce positive charge, we're ramping up the excitation level of the neurons. And the opposite is happening at the cathode, where we're removing positive charge. Um, and, uh, and it's actually quite a small effect, in a way. But, um, but neuroscientists have found that it's a very, very useful tool to explore functioning of the brain, because it changes slightly the um, responses you get in certain experimental conditions. So they've become really, really interested in it. And in fact, the research has just exploded. Right, so, so this is just um, a, a graph of the... You can just do this yourself at PubMed. Um, there's, um, there's a graph um, of the number of publications that um, deal with CDCS. And um, it's really exploded since 2000. So the blip in 2000 is due to um, a German uh, neuroscientist, Michael Nietzsche. Um, this is a picture of him uh, when he was um, starting out his research career, um, self-experimenting. <laughs> with, with a uh, custom-made device. And back then, Nietzsche was being sort of really, really cautious. I mean, they were stimulating at one milliamp for about four seconds. And this is how they started. And now, it's, it's completely common to stimulate at two milliamps for 30 minutes, perhaps daily. So he was really, really cautious. I mean, the reason I wanted to put him up there is he often doesn't get mentioned. So this is kind of my shout-out to Nietzsche. That, you know, he was really the, the guy that started this modern interest in it. Um, but it's actually nothing new. You know, we've been doing this for a long time. These are just some images of adverts. Um, the black and white ones are from uh, the late, late 1800s. Um, and it was really quite common. Was, electricity was new, it was interesting to everybody. They made these kind of products all the time for home use, for medical use. You could buy a medical battery, take it home, buy various electrodes to attach to your head. So there was a real interest in it. And in fact, it goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans. And, and, the, and the two pictures on the right are an electric ray and an electric eel. And it was quite common for them to, to use it um, for the treatment of headaches, the treatment of gout. In fact, electric eels were used by the um, Greeks to, um, uh, to, as painkillers during childbirth, kind of like an ancient TENS machine. Yeah? And, um, 
And these, these animals can, can output 1,000 millivolts, right, at, at voltages of 200 volts or more, right? So, so I mean, they've survived that, right? So, <laughs> um, so it's, it's really nothing new. But, of course, I mean, we understand a lot more about the brain now. We know how it functions. We have a much better idea of the, of the physiological under, underpinnings of, of the kind of alterations we're making. So I just want to make one more point about the science. And, of course, science literature is, is growing. You know, it's, it's doubling. The number of publications annually are doubling sort of every, every 10 years. Um, but that's not the key factor that, that sort of was important for us. I mean, a lot of it is becoming open access. And so this is being driven by, um, by science like Plus One, by journals like Plus One. We also have ResearchGate over in Europe. I think academia.edu is more sort of popular over in the US. Um, and you, you, know, you can really get access to a lot of this research literature. And this is what we were doing. This is what people we knew were doing. And so we were getting really turned on to the science in ways that we couldn't. I mean, I remember when I did my PhD, I mean, the way you got a journalist, you, you trudge up to Senate House Library, you know, and you, there were these sliding <laughs> shelves. You'd walk down, pull out a journal, you'd queue up at the, at the photocopier, <laughs> you'd photocopy your journal, you'd get back to your desk, and then you can read it, right? And now a few clicks, and pretty much anybody can get it, right? And so, so this is really changing the way we interact with science. And I think this is a real challenge for scientists and the way they explain their science, and, and a challenge for, for, for the rest of us in how we interpret and understand the, the, the results and claims that they make. So that was kind of the background to, um, to everything we were looking at. So we were learning about all this. And, um, and we sort of um, fired off, and we, we sort of launched our first product in about 2013. And from the moment we decided we were going to go for it, we were just working full on. So it took us about probably nine months to go from design to distribution. Um, and so we were working day and night on this, and we were learning a lot. We made a lot of mistakes on the way. And, um, and we brought this product out, and it, it really sold well. It was really popular. It almost took us by surprise. And it just turned out there was a lot of other people like us out there who'd been reading the science, who'd been reading the journalism, and thinking, wow, you know, we really want to try this. And there was nothing available. It was either $10,000, $5,000 for some of the kit, or the other kit looked positively dangerous. And so it really, really sold well. But it was also really controversial. I mean, um, it caused a lot of consternation among scientists. Some of them were, were claiming that we should be banned, that it was time for legislation of some kind. And, um, and you know, you can kind of understand why. I and mean, that was, on the left image is, is some of the advertising material we, we ran with. And, you know, it's not the sort of image you'd find on the latest issue of the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, right? I mean, they really didn't like the way we had treated it. And, um, and you know what? It was kind of controversial internally, too. We did this so fast. You know, there was, there's many things we didn't like about it. And to, and to be honest, there were issues you could take with the first product. I mean, you know, not least the positioning and the size of the electrodes. And we had our own issues with it. But we, what we did try to do is, is we really tried to concentrate on some safety issues, partly pushed by Helga, because she realized we were going to do this. She was like, guys, if you're going to do this, can you just please put these things in? And so we had, uh, you know, we had hardware current limiters. Uh, we carried a lot of safety information about who we wanted to use it and who we didn't. And really, we didn't want anybody with any neurological conditions trying this. You know, this was designed for people like us, you know, healthy guys who kind of wanted to try this out because we were excited about the science and the potential of it. That may have been what saved us because certainly um, a, a, another product was, was, was um, and the FDA moved on it and they shut it down. And we were, we were, we were sitting there thinking, Shouldn't somebody be shutting us down now? You know, <laughs> something going to happen, and, and, and kind of nothing did. But we were very careful to, to avoid certain people using it. But you know, one of the one of the complaints that were made was was also the, the the claims that we put on there, and we did go a little bit wild with it. And and it's worth worth stepping back, and, and it did raise issues about efficacy. So. So just, just, just a sort of a pause to look at the kind of claims that were coming out of the, the science. And this is some of them, and I really do just mean some of them. Um, and, you know, it was affecting everything, apparently. It was affecting memory, it was affecting perception, anxiety, depression. You know, it was as if it sort of affected everything. And, and the funny thing was, we had many customers contacting us and kind of corroborating a lot of this, you know. Uh, we even had a guy who um, contacted us and, and, and said he had an amazing effect on his, on his libido, and had um, revived the relationship of his, with his wife of 25 years. And we did worry whether he was placing the electrodes correctly. 
But, uh, but yeah, we, there's a lot of enthusiasm for this stuff, right? And, um, and you know, and there's, there's actually debate in science about this. I mean, I think it's a mistake to think of science as somehow a single scientist having the answer. You know, science doesn't work like that. Science works by debate. It works by a, a, an argument and a consensus moving forward. Um, and there are many scientists who, who really question this science, and they think, well, look, you know, surely one simple technology can't have all these results, right? There must be something else going on. And the proponents argue, well, look, it's not that simple. On the right, there's all the parameters that are involved. So there's montage, which is the placement of the electrodes, the size of the electrodes, the number of the electrodes, the type of current you have. Right? And one of the things I've separated off is, is the sort of associated training program you have, and that's emerged as one of the really key factors here. You know, this isn't like Bradley Cooper in Limitless where you pop this pill and boom, everything happens. It's just not like that. What you're doing is you're changing the neuroplasticity of your, of your brain. So you're, you're priming your brain to perhaps learn new things and slightly different things. And so you've really got to engage in the activity that you want to try and improve. And that's something that's really begun to come out as we understand more about what's really going on in this. So if you look at those parameters, um, we were kind of looking at this thinking, well, you know, like, version one really doesn't do it, right? It's, it's not going to meet all of these. And it was really selling well, and maybe we should just stuck with it because people were buying it. But we thought, well, it's not really going to do what we wanted it to do. We can't really use it in the way we wanted. We can't really reflect what's happening in the science. And so we did a complete redesign. Um, Okay, so that's something just about the montage just to give you an idea, but it sounds like a lot of you guys know about it anyway. So, so depending on where you place it, you get different results. You know, um, there's some research about um, um, if you want to improve maths. Um, you know, Cohen Kadosh has done some work. He put it over your parietal um, cortex. Um, the uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is really implicated in a lot of... It's actually implicated in a lot of neural pathways, and, but it seems to have a lot of results. Uh, the, the right one is the DARPA, which is over a sort of F10 here, and the contralateral shoulder. That's the one they were using in Michael Weissen's lab. Um, so that's just sort of that. But we did a redesign, and what we did was we took the, um, we took the base unit that drove the, um, uh, the current, and you could... Um, uh, you could control all that. We, we separated that from the headset. So our idea was, well, we're going to connect a whole load of different montages to it. And so people can buy the base unit, and they don't need to rebuy the same thing for any different montage, because clearly you want to use it in different ways. And so we separated that off, and we th our idea was that we would, we would have different montages so that there was an ease of usage. Um, and so um, that, this is still on sale, um, and we think... Um, we think it's still one of the most capable devices out there at the price point. I mean, you'd have to pay thousands of dollars to get the same kind of capability. Um, it's got a lot of the safety features that you know, a much more expensive device would have. Um, and and we, we wanted to bring it in at a price point that you know, we, we could all kind of give it a go. And one of the reasons is that with all the studies, what's really come out of this is that actually TDCS is incredibly safe. You know, there has not been many, many negative outcomes out of it. Sure, you shouldn't overuse it, and we actually carry more safety than often the scientists do. So we, in, in descriptions that we give, we all say, well, look, treat it like any training program. You wouldn't go to a gym and just do five days straight, right? You'd give your brain a break and, 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 and progress on it slowly. Um, but it has proved to be extremely safe. So we think it's one of the most capable devices out there. And you know what? There's a heck of a lot of devices out there now. Right, so this is, this is just the devices that are out there now, and this is just some of them. And really, a lot of this come out. And, you know, this is a good thing. You know, it gives a lot of choice to users. Um, some of them really haven't moved much, uh, very far forward from the original devices that we saw. Several of those are ours. We have various versions. Um, there's, there's companies like Think, uh, um, that's like Halo, who are really trying to build an ecosystem around a single montage, which is sort of um, stimulating the motor cortex. Along the, along the central band. I suppose we could have gone for something like that, but we really wanted that usage to sort of come out so that you could use it in all kinds of different ways, depending on how you wanted to use it. Um, there's also there's a lot of clinical trials that have gone through, through now. So SUMA, which I don't know if you can see it clearly, but it's the bottom left with the blue cap. Um, they're just coming out, and they're coming out on the back of um, European uh, certification for the use of TDCS in depression. Um, and so they're trying to launch a whole product that... Um, helps doctors sort of monitor when people are using it and things like this. Uh, we did think about going, going medical, but it wasn't really the thing we were focused on. Uh, we were focused on something else. Um, I think the FDA, I don't think the FDA is, is approving it yet. Um, I, I've heard a lot of people say that um, the pharmaceutical company is going to be 
really resisting that because this is a really cheap, accessible technology. You know? It doesn't have the side effects that other drugs have, but it's also very difficult to patent it. Right? So it's very difficult to build an entire uh, sort of you know, high money value business out of it. Um, we did think about going medical, and it's not something that we, would, you know, we, we totally exclude doing, but it's not really where we had our site set. Where we've had our site set and where we think the really, really exciting bit comes in with this kind of technology is what's being called closed-loop stimulation. And here it gets really kind of cool. Right? So, so, the, so the idea is um, here, instead of just blindly putting sort of electrodes on in a certain place and stimulating a certain region of the brain, you actually respond to states that the brain is in. And, um, and so, I mean, there's some really good research that's come out. So, so uh, and I'm just pointing at some of them here. So, um, so there's, there's research on the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So if you have low-level Parkinson's, you have sort of tremors in your hand. And these have neural correlates in the motor cortex. And so what you can do is record the phase and frequency of these, um, these, um, these tremors. And you can construct um, a, an equal and opposite um, oscillating stimulation that just cancels those tremors down. I mean, this research was actually done using an armband to, to record the tremor with the hand. And that has... That has good neural correlates with the, with the motor cortex. Um, and we've actually put an accelerometer in the latest device we've brought out, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but this could also be done with EEG. Right? And also, they've done this with, um, uh, with epilepsy. So you need to record um, when an epileptic seizure is, um, is being triggered, and then you put some counter um, stimulation to sort of reduce, the, reduce that tremor. Those are, those are two medical um, applications, but there are others as well. There's a great paper, actually, with the, which Nietzsche was behind, um, uh, that went into nature in 2014. 14 is that? I have to remember, yeah. Um, to do with lucid dreaming. And um, I don't know how much, how much you might know about lucid dreaming, but the idea is, um, I mean, uh, is that um, uh, you can be in a dream state and be partially aware you're in that dream state, so you can access um, parts of your consciousness that you couldn't access in a totally conscious state, and that allows you to do lots of reasoning that you wouldn't otherwise do, is the idea. And, um, and uh, Vos showed that um, if you stimulate at um, 40 hertz tax, so oscillating a sine wave um, stimulation, um, during REM sleep, then you can trigger a lot of this, uh, this, this lucid dreaming state. We were really interested in this. Um, we're not sure it works, to be honest. We've, we've done some other tests, so we, we haven't really run on it yet. So I think some more science needs to be done on it before you know, we can really be sure that we can trigger it. And I think other scientists have begun getting into it and then realized, actually, it may not be so... So um, it's uh, such a guaranteed result, which makes an interesting point about, I mean, Nietzsche is one of the best scientists who's doing the research on this. You want to understand the underlying physical, physiological processes. I mean, Nietzsche is a great guy to read, and he's really interested in that. And the claims he makes tend to be quite moderated. Um, so he's behind this paper. But, but again, no one scientist has the answer. And I think you know, a, a community has to come behind this thing. It needs to be replicated several times before you can really gain the confidence to sort of say, well, look, you can launch a commercial product specifically around that. But there's lucid dreaming. There's also um, consolidation of, um, of, um, of um, memory um, during deep, uh, slow, slow wave um, sleep is when we consolidate a lot of our waves. And it's been shown that if you, if you stimulate at um, delta frequencies during that time, you can consolidate more of those memories. But everybody's, um, uh, everybody's slow oscillations occur at different frequencies. And so if you can record the frequencies at which the, uh, uh, our, our particular brains are oscillating and stimulate at precisely those frequencies, so it's like a personalized stimulation, then that increases that memory consolidation much further than it would do if you just did it at some oscillation frequency that doesn't correlate directly with your own personal brain waves. And so this kind of stuff is, is kind of really, it's really cool. So, so we wanted to build something that really came around this, and, and this is really where we were heading. And not just, not just in the stimulation, because there's this question about, well, look, what is it doing to the brain? I mean, what are these, uh, these stimulation inter interventions doing? And without some sort of monitoring of what's happening in the brain, we can't really be sure that we've changed anything at all. And so we wanted to build a device that can do all of these things. So you can actually decide, okay, we've done the stimulation. What was the prior state, and what's the, what's the state after we've, we've executed the stimulation? And so what we've come up with is this. It's just been launched. Um, Jeffrey's actually said, thanks. <laughs> Um, and it sort of, it sort of, it does pack in quite a lot. Uh, we try to put in everything that we could possibly think of that uh, that you might sort of need. Um, and so it is it has just launched. I mean, you can you can go and find out more specs about it. So I won't, probably won't say sort of too much. Um, 
But uh, we're kind of rolling it out. You know, some of the some of the hardware, uh, all the hardware is kind of there. Some of the supporting firmware isn't there, but we've made it so that we can um, we can update it remotely, and so we can carry on adding to sort of features and perhaps even um, put some processing on the ARM chip. So it's got a it's got an ARM Cortex chip on it. It's built around the Eddie Eddie S twelve ninety nine, which is brought out by um, by TI, um, and it's got Wi-Fi. Um, it, um, it, it works on the IoT framework, so this has become very popular generally, so MQTT framework and streams um, data up to, the, um, up to a cloud server. So our kind of idea is that um, once we get the data up into the cloud, and we can do all kinds of things about it. And this is what, this is what gets me, me off when, when I can get all that data there, and now I've got a powerful server and I can run all kinds of algorithms over it. And, um, and, and we'll integrate with other cloud um, services. So this is all kind of the plan. We've put it out there really so that other developers can get involved. You can build your own um, uh, own um, um, in interaction with other devices as well. And we're really debating internally what we might, um, might do ourselves with it. So I guess I wanted to um, leave you guys, this is Transtex, I wanted to leave you with like a little bit of research that's come out quite lately. And it's, it's kind of taking us back to where we began. Um, it kind of always struck us that, you know, um, Sally Adi talked about this Zen-like state, and, and no scientists had really investigated that. We all got carried away with accelerated learning and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but um, some research has come out. I mean, there was a, there was a, a letter to the editor of uh, the Journal of Brain Stimulation just last month, uh, a really nice sort of study where they tried to... Um, they, they did a control study of people who had um, come newly to meditation. They'd never done it before. And they had a control study that didn't use TDCS and, and, and a, a group that did and found that the group that did use it were far, uh, far more able to learn that meditation and get a lot further down that training program. Um, and so, you know, so that's... So in, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, we're, we're really just scratching the surface of this. You know, even in TDCS, I mean, great, we like, like closed root brain stimulation, but even in, in the applications of TDC itself, we, we really are scratching the surface. We don't really understand, you know, all the possibilities or all the different ways we might utilize this. But clearly, it's having a physiological effect on the brain, and, um, and we need to understand more about this. So we want developers to get involved. I think the more people that get involved in anything, that's when we solve problems. You know, if we're sitting away in a hole and trying to come up with something, then we won't do it if we can involve everybody and get everybody involved and give them a hardware stack or some, some tools to, to, to investigate it themselves. That's when we solve problems. So the more people get involved, the more quickly we'll understand this and come up with solutions. Um, so that's what we're hoping for. Thank you very much.